Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters, and thank you very much for joining us in this video. We hope and pray that you and your families are well. Hopefully you're staying safe and you are uh, being watchful and prayerful. Uh, there's a lot going on out there. Not only is the coronavirus an issue, but we have all sorts of things going on on a local and state and even federal level. And um, I just want to invite you to be careful, be safe, be discerning, uh, be bold, be wise, okay? And uh, just make sure you take care of yourselves, okay? Uh, this is a very trying time, and really we need the Lord to bless us and direct us uh, in a way that only He can. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to talk to you about something. Uh, the recent events that have been ongoing uh, have been very troubling uh, for a lot of people. There are all sorts of things being said, and there is a lot of uh, confusion on what to do and what, what roads to take. Um, and we, we want to, as much as possible, just develop a biblical idea of things, okay? Uh, all throughout our history, the church has been called on to really direct the society. Even though we have officials and governments and establishments, uh, really the uh, way this country is built, the success of the country is built on the ability of the country to operate within a Judeo-Christian worldview. And uh, that speaks to a lot of things. And unfortunately, we have not always given the response that is needed to help mend some of the gaps within our uh, society in order to form a peaceful uh, world and a peaceful country. And so I want to look at a few passages. I really understand now more than ever that the Bible is not just intended to be read for the sake of the determining the truth that it states. Um, you know, doing that can put truth in our head and we can form very uh, appealing and attractive arguments, but it doesn't always help us understand how that truth applies to our life, okay? But what we wanna do is we want to understand how does the Bible help us build a better world? Right? How does the Bible gives us, give us the information we need to make a better creation? Okay? And we want to understand and even look at a way in which we can read the Bible and draw a relevant application. This is what the, the, the biblical uh, characters did. They took Old Testament passages, brought them into the present, and they used it to understand the times and then work towards a more formidable society. All right? So we're going to do that today. Now, the question I want to, to, to look at today is how far are Christians to go at uh, uh, being critical of our local, state, and federal government officials? All right, this is the big question I want to talk about because we've seen some behavior lately um, that has been, uh, just to be quite direct, uh, inappropriate. Um, Th there have been some things that have happened that are, that are just, these things are just inexcusable, all right? And now the question becomes, how far do we go as Christians at addressing, correcting, or criticizing some of the things that are being done, all right? I want you to take a look at some of the behavior really quick that has uh, happened over the past few days and I want you to uh, uh, just think with me as we consider some of this activity. Just take a look. Now, brothers and sisters, what we have just witnessed is, is, quite, is quite shocking. And 
we are in no way excusing the behavior of looters, of rioters, of people who have been uh, uh, set on causing confusion, confusion and even sabotaging the peaceful protest. That is not at all excusable. Uh, that is bad, right? But here's the thing. When we elect certain officials into office, we expect a certain conduct. We expect a certain, uh, a certain uh, implementation of justice, certain uh, stance on doing things righteously, doing things with character and integrity. And when that doesn't happen, because we elected those officials into office, then there is not only a responsibility of the citizens to address this misconduct, but it is more appropriately a responsibility of the church to address this misconduct. And I want to prove this by the Bible. I want to look at a passage in Luke chapter three, because when I thought about this over and over again, a lot of the times I remain somewhat hesitant to involve myself and matters that are surrounded around political affairs. And here's the thing about that. While we as Christians are never called to be politicians, we are called to take serious positions on matters that affect government. In other words, there's a difference between government and politics. We are not out trying to determine who, who is right, who has the right to do certain things or what side are we going to be on? But we do absolutely have a, a responsibility towards addressing the way government, that is dominion, rule and power affects the way we as Christians live our lives and how those decisions that are made by our officials impact the way the God community exists. OK, and I want to show you that in this text now. Here we are in Luke chapter three, verse number 19. It says, as John was going about preaching the gospel, uh, he was speaking to people who were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. They had expected the Messiah to come. And John in preaching the gospel did something in verse number 19 that we don't always hear about whenever we're talking about the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the testimony of the saints. It says, John also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrongs he had done. Verse 20 says, so Herod put John in prison, adding this sin to his many others. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. The first thing is, what in the world did Herod do to warrant such public criticism from John the Baptist. What in the world was going on? We do know that he had a, a marital issue that John didn't agree with, but the other question becomes, what were the other things that caused John to be so hostile against Herod? And the second thing we should consider is why Herod? Why not Caesar? Why not one of the other officials of, of other uh, domains and other territories. Why was Herod such a problem? And I want to answer these questions in order to answer the question of how far do we go with criticizing our political or should we say government officials? Is there even any grounds for doing so? I want to look at this and establish the point that we have an utmost responsibility to criticize, correct, and reprove those who lead us. The first thing I want to bring out is there are all sorts of parallels between this particular instance in which we read in Luke chapter three in our own world, in today's world. Herod was someone we were, we would be quite familiar with. Herod was the individual who was insecure. He was unsure of his right to rule. He sought out ways to legitimize himself as a, a, a decent ruler, as an appropriate ruler, as a person who had a right, <clears throat> excuse me, to rule. And he did so by taking part 
in ambitious architecture projects, building these outstanding buildings, these outstanding uh, 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 projects that would, that would literally substantiate his right to be a ruler and to be a fit ruler at that. Another thing he did, however, is he accumulated the appreciation, or should we say, the support of the leaders of God's community. In other words, he called the leaders of the church together and he, quite frankly, he bought them. He catered to their aristocratic desires and he gave them positions that served their own interest instead of serving the interest of the people that they were responsible for. And a society of aristocrats that catered to the ambitions of Herod was formed. And here in this text, Luke condemns publicly Herod, not only for his marital affairs, but also for the other wrongs that he had committed. And this is where we meet the question of what those wrongs were. What was in the mind of John the Baptist that caused him to preach so publicly against Herod? Well, in searching all of the different commentaries, there, there's not much information there. Josephus gives us a bit of information, but even there, there's seemingly debate on the legitimacy of, of those accounts. But what we find in Matthew chapter two is a story about Herod that gives us understanding of what might have been going through the mind of John the Baptist that compelled him to preach against Herod. It is a story about Jesus being born and Herod being completely, completely disturbed by the fact that people were saying a king has been born in Jerusalem. In other words, his intimidation caused him be, to him to become fearful and it moved him, to, it moved him excuse me, to search such absurd behavior that it would have warranted the rebuke of any person who was really concerned with the justice of God. I want you to see what happens in Matthew chapter two. Here it is, Jesus is born, Herod gets word of it, and notice what he does next in Matthew chapter two, verse number three. It says, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting, look at this, of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be shepherd for my people Israel. It's an interesting thing here, brothers and sisters, that Herod had the sort of relationship that he could call the leaders of God's people together and ask them certain questions that would dictate the way he governed. I think it is important to make a note there because that's the way it should be. It is the responsibility of the church to feed the minds of those who are in positions that make a difference in the way that we live. We should be called to the table. We should be there giving answers. It should be that we are there imparting the wisdom of God to people who are responsible for leading us. But here's the thing. What happens when we give the wrong response? What happens whenever we don't give the right answer to the questions of those who are asking us what should be done? What should we do? How might I exemplify proper leadership? What happens when we fail our government? I'll show you. Herod again continues. He now goes from meeting with the chief priest and those who are leaders and teachers of the law to now moving and having a meeting with the wise men. And he learned from them that they would see a star and this star would direct them to where Jesus was. This, this directions 
These are the directions that he gave them in verse number seven. Herod called a private meeting with the wise men and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so what, so that I can go and worship him too. Now, I want you to see here, after this interview, they went, saw Jesus, they saw where he was, they bowed before him, they worshiped him. Something happened in verse number 12. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. In other words, God revealed to them what Herod was trying to do, and they had the, the humility, they had the spirituality to avoid the tactics and what Herod was trying to do to them in order to keep those innocent people safe. In fact, Joseph also had a dream, becoming aware of how Herod would try to kill all of those innocent children, including Jesus, because of his own evil ambition. Here's the question. Why didn't the chief priest and the teachers of the law have a dream? Why didn't God, why wasn't God communicating to them? Why wasn't it that whenever the chief priests were called to have a meeting with Herod, there was something there that said, watch out, there's something going on with this man that will not allow him to use your advice or your information for the benefit of the people. Why is that? We find out, brothers and sisters, that there were people in this passage having all sorts of communication with God that would not allow them to take part in the evils of what Herod was doing. But for some reason, the chief priest and the teachers of the law, they were not able to escape this sword of temptation. Brothers and sisters, I want to show you here, whenever the church fails to have dreams, that is whenever we are no longer hearing from God, but yet we're still giving advice to people who have the ability to make powerful decisions in this world, we put innocent people's, we put their lives at risk and we make it possible for injustice to become murderous and innocent people die without a cause. That's what happens. Notice what happens here. Verse 16 says, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. I love the way the, the, the verse 16 says in the King James Version, he saw that he was mocked of the wise men. In other words, the wise men would have no parts in it. They didn't want to be affiliated with the propaganda. They didn't want to be affiliated with the things that were happening within Herod's council. They avoided him. They did not take part in it. But this is what he did in his anger. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Where were the wise men, or excuse me, where were the chief priest. Where were the teachers of the law? Where were the people that were expected to protect innocent people during this moment? And here's what we find out, brothers and sisters. Anytime the position is taken that would allow for the death of innocent people, whether they are African Americans who are being targeted by, an, by a corrupt political system, or whether it is the initiative of an organization to take away the lives of children that are not yet birthed into this world. We have a moral and a Christian obligation to stand up, to speak out, and advise against certain policies. This is not about choosing sides in any way, form or fashion. This is about standing on the Lord's side, standing on the side of the gospel, which does not run away from things that are pertaining to matters that are relevant in this world, but rather it embraces it strongly, speaks against it, 
and, and demand that something be done to protect those who cannot protect themselves. This is all important. This is a part of preaching the gospel. This is a part of standing up for truth. This is a part of being a Christian. It is saying no to injustice in all forms. So when I look at John the Baptist and I think about what he did, I'm looking at it and I'm saying to myself, this is what incited the public rebuke, the public criticism. Here is a man facing a system that very well could have taken his life. <laughs> he was a person, a victim of injustice. The only difference between his story and the story of many people who were born in his own time was that he survived it and he dared not live in silence. Instead, what he did is he took that gospel, he took that proclamation, he preached to the people who had been waiting for a time of justice and godly rule. And he used it to criticize a person who had taken the lives of so many people who could have very well taken his own life. But he saw it as a manner by which God's providence provided an opportunity to speak on so many people who had not lived to speak as he was speaking in his own time. And brothers and sisters, let's just be honest. We have the same responsibility today. Speak it up, speak out, speak out. Let it, your voices be heard and let somebody know at the White House, in your own local government, in your own state government, it is indecent, it is improper, it is unjust, it is ungodly to take an innocent life in any form. We have to do this, brothers and sisters. And so let us not question whether we should be silent. We have all the proof here on why it is wrong. It is wrong to do the sort of things we are seeing done in our world. And we can't stand for it as Christians. We cannot stand for it. It is ungodly to stand for it. It is ungodly to be silent about it. So brothers and sisters, let us bring these things to the table. Let's talk about this. Let's put this into the ear of our officials. Let's take a stand. We're not politicians, no, but we are people who believe in godly rule. And the Bible teaches about godly rule, about the government operating in a godly fashion. This is why the prophet said the government should be on his shoulders, not the politicians, not the politics, should be on his shoulders, but the government, the rule should be on his shoulders. And so brothers and sisters, because God is concerned with government, so must we be concerned with government. And we must demand proper conduct, godly rule, and justice for all, all right? So I want you to think about these things. I want you to pray about it and ask the Lord to give you the insight on how this should be done. And peradventure, we can take part in the revolution of peace, safety, and justice based on what is given to us from the Word of God. All right? So, brothers and sisters, we thank you. We hope this has been helpful. We hope this answers some sort of question for you. And uh, Lord willing, we'll come together and we'll continue to bang our heads against the Word of God so that we can understand how to live this thing out in real time. All right? But until the next time, be safe. Take care. Be wise, be bold, be courageous, and allow the Lord to use you in a magnificent way. Until next time, God bless and take care.